Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to be back here again and to be studying. I was wondering why you were raising your hands, whether this was a charismatic meeting or something. But I, okay, it's, it's Chad. So you, 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 some, some people need their notes here still. Uh, it's good to be back uh, again, studying the book of Ruth and seeing the lessons of faith that are so applicable even to our own lives. Don't you love the Word of God where every part of it is like honey and sweeter than even honey in terms of how it can refresh us, whether you've been walking many years with the Lord or you've just started on this journey of following the Lord, the Lord can revive your soul uh, through His Word and in the way in which even Ruth teaches us and Naomi teaches us and Boaz teaches us to follow Christ. You remember we set the scene a little bit yesterday the hero of this story is singular, and it's none of these characters, really, because they're weak sinners like you and me. But the hero of this story is God, is Yahweh, and His power and His faithfulness and His sovereignty that is demonstrated throughout this whole book. And our journey here in studying Ruth is not to try and become heroes or become great. That's so frustrating when you study the Bible and you study characters and you set such a high standard sometimes for some of these characters that they become way unapproachable. Uh, but you study any character in the Bible, and they have clay feet. And that helps us to understand that really our approach to studying these characters is to, to have the same faith in the same great God that they had. And so we can do, not because we are great, not because they are great, the same exploits and great things for God because he is great, and he's able to make the weak stand up and be strong in Christ. And that is what the book of Ruth is all about. True faith grows by the grace of God in the soil of adversity. This is the wisdom of the shepherd. True faith grows as God even prunes us as the great vine dresser and causes us to, to face sometimes the hard things in life so that we may become like Christ. And it's even a reality that has been promised to us in the gospel. You remember verses like Philippians 1, 29? For to you it has been granted, literally given as a gift by God, not only to believe in His name, but also to suffer for his sake. We love the first part of that verse. It's the second part that's harder to digest, isn't it? But it's all part of the gifts of God that he would give us not only faith, but he would also grow that faith through the sufferings of life. In fact, God's children suffer more than others. And it's an indication that he loves us. He loves us so much that he wants us to become less like ourselves and more like Jesus. And so the book of Ruth, as we looked at it yesterday, and I'm not going to recap too much, shows us the beginning of really the transition from the book of Judges where there is a lack of faith. In fact, there is faithlessness. And out of the seeds of that faithlessness that even gets carried away to a man like Elimelech and the way in which he runs away from the promised land to a land of Moab where God has even warned the Israelites that they should not go, they should not turn. We see the roots of faith beginning to be generated in Naomi and Ruth and Orpah. Isn't it interesting? This is a book like no other in some ways where we can see the faithlessness of the men, and so men, this is a lesson for us, and the faithfulness of the women, okay? Because we haven't gotten to Boaz yet, at least in this chapter. And so it's just a lesson in humility, I know for me particularly, uh, many times, to learn from the women, even inspired through the Word of God, and, and to say, not necessarily that they're the leaders, but Lord, help us to step up to the plate again as we look at these women and we see them following God faithfully. And so we, we find this contrast, as even Peter read earlier today, about in contrast to Elimelech, we find Ruth and Naomi particularly as being models of faith in this passage in Ruth chapter 1 verses 6 and following. 
It is faith that is the only tool that allows us to live for God. And faith that is not of ourselves, but as we study throughout the Scriptures, is always a gift of God. True faith is never something that I can take credit for and say, this is mine. But true faith that helps me to persevere in life is always something that comes from the throne room of heaven. We know verses like Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, isn't it? That faith is a gift of God so that no man or woman may boast. My, my dad is, is a, a real role model to me. I praise God for, for him. He's been 40 years in ministry. Some of you even know him. And he has been a role model to me in so many ways, but particularly in his faith in God that has kept him through some of the hardest times in life. I remember, I think it was about five or six years ago where he was going through a severe t- trial, and the details aren't important, but I traveled down to Pune, where he lives, and I live about six or seven hours away from him, uh, just to meet with him. And my first statement to him was, Dad, after all these years of ministry, you've been faithful to God for decades. You just don't deserve this, Dad. And I remember, without skipping a beat, he turned to me and he said, I deserve hell. He said, it's the grace of God that I have any goodness in life. I I deserve to be in the darkest part of hell. And so he said, Sammy, this just helps me to look at the situation and say, you know what? This doesn't matter. I am secure in Christ. And I think that is what we see in in any person that goes through the the darkest valleys of life. It is faith that becomes the, the light of God in those dark valleys that enables you to have a perspective that helps you to rise above those situations and even be victorious in those situations. And so this morning, we're going to be studying two roots of a God-given faith, because it has to be given by God, that is demonstrated particularly, not so much in Orpah, there's three ladies in this passage, but one of them is an apostate, and we're going to be considering that, but particularly Ruth and Naomi become a lesson to us, an illustration for us, even as we live our lives in this day and age, as to what a God-given faith looks like and what its roots are and how we can grow in it. And so we start again in Ruth chapter 1 and verse 6, and if you have your copy of God's Word, turn to it. The most important thing we can do today is to be looking at the Word of God and seeing what God says in it. And if you don't have one, then turn to somebody next to you and ask them to share, right? So Ruth chapter 1 and verses 6 and 7, and we're going to go all the way to verse 18. This is going to be our main text for today. Two roots of a God-given faith. Two roots of a God-given faith. And the first one is found particularly in the illustration of this dear lady, Naomi. And so we're going to be looking at verses 6 and 7. Then she arose, let me just read that again, verse 6, with her daughters-in-law, this is Naomi, that she might return from the land of Moab For she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord, Yahweh, had visited his people in giving them food. We talked a little bit about that yesterday, but I just want to revisit this idea of God visiting his people. It's interesting, somehow, without email and without technology, Naomi had some way of communicating back with the people of Israel in Bethlehem that she loved, and she still had her heart there because she still valued that as the promised land. And so there was a word that came to her, a word even from Yahweh, that God had done something good, and the famine had been reversed, which which meant that there were people back in Israel that were repenting, and God was blessing that repentance. And so Naomi hears this word, and she believes it by faith, and she returns. In fact, there are three verbs of actions. She arose, she returned, and she went out. But the actions of faith are all based on the word of what God has done. And it's always that way, right? Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, and hearing the word of Christ. For us, it is all 
based on what Jesus has done on Calvary 2,000 years ago. That's where our faith comes from. But for Naomi, even initially, it's this idea of God restoring his people by giving them food. And so the first root of a God-given faith has to be confidence, but not confidence in what we can see with our eyes, but confidence in what we can see through the eyes of faith, that which is unseen, right? Faith lives on that which is unseen, which is actually more real, isn't it? And so Naomi has a confidence not in the promises of this earth, but she has a confidence in the promises of God. I was encouraged many years ago to read a a book by Spurgeon, and I don't know if any of you have been introduced to Spurgeon. If you haven't, you need to start reading Spurgeon, okay? He's, He's dead, but he still speaks. It's interesting how some of the best people that minister to us are dead today, but praise God for his writings that are still there. He wrote a book that was called basically the checkbook of faith. And Spurgeon was so concerned that that Christians have such a pessimistic view on life that he decided to collate, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, all the promises of God, and he called it the checkbook of faith. You know, just like you go to the ATM or the bank, and in time of need, you need some food, you withdraw some money. Spurgeon said even more than that, we need to withdraw the promises of God. And we need to live by the promises of God. And that is where faith starts, isn't it? Initially, the promise of salvation in Jesus Christ, but all the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. And so Naomi begins to believe that as she hears that it's not just some kind of a natural accident that food is there in Israel again, but it is because Yahweh has visited His people. Yahweh was disciplining His people And now Yahweh is restoring His people. And all things happen through the hand of Yahweh as a faithful father. God is a God who is moved by our sinful condition to act and deal with us in ways of grace. What a great God we have. He's not distanced from us, but He seeks to visit us. In in fact, I I just want to do a little bit of a survey of this, this idea of visiting. You remember... Naomi had only seven books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch and, and Job, and, and uh, she had Psalms, and, and, and that was it. And so she was reflecting on these books and, and generating an idea of what faith was. What, what, what did this mean to her? Well, she may have been reflecting on verses like Genesis 50, verse 24, and Joseph said to his brethren, this is Joseph on his deathbed, I die but God will surely visit you, this is in Egypt, and bring you out of this land into the land which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. And and Joseph was even prophesying in 400 years, God is going to visit you in his sovereign grace and bring you back to a place that is the promised land where he's going to make you a nation again. And it was probably those kinds of ideas that was was beginning to encourage Naomi's heart. And she said, I have to act on this. I can't be in Moab anymore. You know, just some other Old Testament passages. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 21. This is, this is precious. And Yahweh visited Hannah. And she conceived and gave birth to three sons. Every time the womb is open, and I've seen this five times, and it's always a miracle, you know, just to see those babies come out. And I've been in the delivery room and, you know, one of my friends, he said, he's a pastor too, he says every time he's in the delivery room, he just says it just to freak out the nurses and doctors, isn't evolution grand? And, and it's just an illustration of the fact that we live under the hands of a gracious and sovereign God. Yahweh visited Hannah, and she conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters, and the boy Samuel, yours truly, grew before the Lord. God visited Hannah and opened her womb. You know, another great verse, Psalm 65, verse 9. Thou dost visit the earth and cause it to overflow. Every time, you know, there's fruit on your trees in your garden, that's not an accident. It's the visiting of Yahweh. It's the visiting of God upon your life. Sometimes we we get so distanced from that, that because we just go to the store and we just see fruit there all the time. But this is an illustration that we live under the hands of a gracious God. Psalm 65, verse 9, let me read the rest of the, the, thou dost visit the earth, 
cause it to overflow, and thus greatly enrich it. The stream of God is full of water. Thou dost prepare their grain, for thou dost prepare the earth. That, that same Hebrew word, pekad, is used throughout to speak about even God sending rain. Remember Jesus spoke about this? God sends his rain upon the just and the unjust because he's a gracious God but particularly to his own children. And this is what we've got to believe in, that we have a God who visits us. He's not a deist who just wound up this earth and left us to just be to our own devices, but he is moved by our destitution, and he visits us in our time of need, especially in Jesus Christ. Zechariah spoke of Jesus in just exactly this way when he heard about Jesus being born through Mary. In Luke chapter 1, verse 68, Zechariah in the New Testament, not the Old Testament, Zechariah said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. And so I believe that 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 was what was going on in Naomi's mind. It's not just a casual sort of thought, oh, there's food in, in Israel again, but there is grace from God Because he has promised that he will bless us in the promised land and I don't need to be in Moab anymore. I need to get up and go. I don't know what I have there, but I need to trust not by sight, but by faith that God is going to bless me if I obey him. And so she gets up and goes. You know, so often I think that's the call that is upon us as we live in our trials and that is to live not by what we can see, that is the things of this earth, but to live upon that which is unseen in the hand of God in faith so that he may do greater things in our life. Amen? And so Naomi gets up and goes. And you would say, okay, maybe this is going to be a fantastic turn to the story and now she's going to have these two girls with her, her two daughter-in-laws, and she's going to have them support her and all kinds of amazing things are going to happen. But we move into the second part of this narrative, of this story, and it is Naomi really helping her daughters-in-law not to say, just come with me, but to say, if you want to come with me, you got to count the cost. And that's exactly what Jesus reminds us we need to do time and time again, right? And if you turn just quickly to Luke chapter 14, you can see this in many passages, but it stands out particularly in this place, Luke chapter 14 and verses 26 and following. Luke chapter 14, verses 26 and following. I think this is what Naomi is doing as she turns to Ruth and Orpah. In Jesus' words, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children, and brothers, and sisters, and yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Verse 27, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has even enough to complete it? We see buildings like this all the time in India. I don't know if you have that in Australia where they're just half done or maybe it's only the foundation because they didn't count the cost. But the most devastating thing is if that happens spiritually to people. Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation, verse 29, and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him. And so Naomi knows that she's counted the cost. But she wants to assume, I don't know how much time has passed between the death of Machlon and Kilion. I think it's not that much time. She doesn't want to assume that Ruth and Orpah know the Lord and follow the Lord. And so before they come with her, she wants to make sure that they're not just following her, but they're following Yahweh. Again, Spurgeon. I'm probably going to irritate you with Spurgeon quotes all throughout this week. But he said this, he said, I pray to God that there is no one in my church, the Metropolitan, that follows Charles Spurgeon because they won't last for more than 10 minutes. But I pray to God that the people that are in my church are following the Lord Jesus Christ. And this becomes the challenge for us even in our churches, right? In India and in Australia, 
we have a lot of apostates, to use a biblical term, that are not sitting outside of the church, but are sitting in the church. And we're not clarifying for them in compassion. The biggest and the most loving thing we can do for them is to help them to know whether they are there because of Christ or just because of some other superficial reason. And you can see the godliness of Naomi even in seeking to disciple and clarify for these two women, do you love Yahweh more than me? That's important before you come to Israel. And so we can see the first root of a God-given faith is a confidence in God's promises. That's with Naomi. But now you can see the second root of a God-given faith is are you clinging to the Lord alone? Are you clinging to the Lord alone? So many Christians in the church are clinging to Christian culture rather than to Christ, right? How do you know you're a Christian? Well, I've got a Christian car. How do, it's, it's got a Christian sticker on it, right? I wear Christian t-shirts. I, I'm always hanging out at Christian bookstores. You know, it's all these external things. But are we clinging not just to the cultural wrapping of Christianity, which is so dangerous at times, or maybe just to Christian friendships? Are we clinging to the Lord alone? And this is what Naomi seeks to clarify with Ruth and Orpah. So important, I think even in this in this gathering, I wouldn't assume that just because you're here that you're a Christian. I would say even today, maybe some of you need to examine your hearts and say, am I clinging to Christ? Or do I just like these people because they're nice and there's a great you know, coffee table out there and, and, and churches, just have, churches have just good food. You know, we, we come sometimes for the wrong reasons. So let's examine our hearts And for those of us that are believers, this would be an encouraging time to even begin to examine others in our church and and in compassion draw them back to the Lord. It's interesting as you you look at this this passage, as she she departs from this place in verse 7 where she were, and her two daughter-in-laws, they don't stay behind, they come with her. And they went on the way, which means maybe there's a few kilometers that they're still walking with her. There's a sense of even commitment that they have just to her in human love to return to the land of Judah. There was some kind of affection that was there on the human level, maybe because of Naomi just being a woman of integrity, a woman of compassion, a woman who loved God, that they wanted to be with her, both of them, Ruth and Orpah. And so, Naomi has taught these women something about the promises of God, but one was an apostate. Orpah was an apostate, and Ruth was a true believer. Just like today, there's many goats hiding in the church, but only trials will expose them as false. What did Jesus say? Many will say to me on that day, Matthew chapter 7, Lord, Lord, but I will say, depart from me because I never knew you. There was that lack of that secret intimacy with God. I remember years ago, even when I was at at the master's college or the master's university, there was a a young man there who was always getting straight A's in all his classes. He had a photographic memory. He would read John Calvin's Institutes, and the next day he had, you know, page numbers memorized, and he would be quoting paragraphs from there. And, And there was a sense of jealousy that we had towards him, like, you know, goodness, why has God given you so much in terms of your gifts? And we never had any doubts that he was following Christ until that summer, I think it was after the first year, we got a report that he was in jail. And he was in jail because he had uh, molested uh, this this young person in in one of the malls in, in that area. And when some of us went to visit him, it was so shocking because he had made all these professions of faith But the moment that he was exposed in that situation, he said, I don't want anything to do with Christ. I don't want anything to do with you people. I just want to be here. I don't believe in God. And that has happened many times. Maybe in your life you can say that has happened many times. And it's a wake-up call to know that there are goats that are in our midst, right? Praise God for this godly example of Naomi where she she doesn't want to say, yeah, come along for the ride. I need some help. She says, no, I, I want to make sure that if you're with me, You're with Christ first. And so she clarifies. 
And so we can, we can see maybe a, a little bit of a testing ground even between what is false faith and true faith. What is false faith and true faith? Let, let me just show you, you know, even quickly, Hebrews chapter 6. And you can, you can jump there if you want or you can just listen to me. I've started teaching the book of Hebrews in my church in Goa and it is just so refreshing. But Hebrews chapter 6 has a, a little bit of a, a warning uh, to us. And it says in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4, these, these interesting words, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 and following. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God, they've even sat under good preaching and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. They've seen the power of the Holy Spirit in the church as people are getting convicted around them and then have fallen away after a while of, of being under all that good grace but not submitting to it, they fall away. These are some scary words. It is impossible. It is very difficult, yea, even impossible, for them to renew them again to repentance since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. You know, this is the idea of tasting but not eating. Are you like that? You know, you're just window shopping, but you're not buying anything. And, and so there are sometimes some people like that, like Orpa, that are in the midst of the church. They might even be singing next to you but they haven't given their life in full submission to Jesus Christ. What's the contrast, if you turn back to Ruth chapter 1, between false faith and true faith? Well, if you look at verses 8 through 10, you can find this first thing. Orpah finds comfort in just the love of Naomi. She loves Naomi, but she doesn't love Yahweh. And there is just this kind of the milk of human kindness, right, that we can be attracted to. And sometimes the church can be full of that. And so you can see Naomi saying to her two daughters-in-law, in fact, she, she says three times, count the cost, return my daughters, don't come with me unless you really are committed to Yahweh. And so she says in verse 8, go return each of you to your mother's house. Go back to the comforts that you can find in this life. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead. You have, been, you have been good to me. You have been good to me in my time of trial as I've lost my sons. You have been good to me as I've lost my husband. May, may God give you that common grace. And then she kissed them. And I love this, this phraseology where it shows that even as an unbeliever, Orpah joins in with Naomi and Ruth and does what? They lifted up their voices and they wept. Even though there wasn't salvation, there was that sort of natural affection that was there between these ladies. And so initially even Orpah was there because she has that sense of affection and love for her mom-in-law. And there are so many in the church that are there just because they love people, right? How many times have you had conversations with people even in the church as a believer where you've just been nice to them, but they've never known about the fact that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. And you've allowed that to continue, where you, you've, you've allowed them to experience the benefits of the grace that God has given you without showing them where it comes from. And so there is that danger sometimes where people will like us, but they know nothing about the roots of where our love comes from. from we love because he first loved us. We love because of the cross, and they don't know that. So Naomi's concerned for these things. It goes on to say in verse 10, and they said to her, and this includes Orpah, no, you know, even though she says to them, return to the comforts of your mothers. Stay in Moab. And they both say, no, but we will surely return with what? With you. See the affection there? We love you. We will return with you to your people. And so there is that, that first danger of false faith where people might just love us, but they don't know the cost of following Christ. And Orpah even makes a commitment with tears. 
Not godly tears, though. Worldly tears. Not to Yahweh, but to Naomi. Well, there's a second aspect of, of false faith. I think you can, you can see here as Naomi keeps pressing, eventually Orpah leaves. And why does she leave? It's because of earthly security. And so Naomi continues to, to ask them to return. She does this three times in verse 11. She says, return, my daughters. And she becomes more intense in the Hebrew. Why should you go with me? Okay, I think you, you think I have things to give you, but let me clarify to you. Have I yet sons in my womb, verse 11, that they may be your husbands? And she's indicating, best case scenario, she's in her 50s, and in those days she's past menopause already. And she's saying, just realistically, you know, even in terms of getting new husbands, if you're with me, there is no future for you. She's being very realistic. That if you come with me, you need to realize that you are going to lose everything on this earth. She goes on to say, return my daughters, verse 12, go for I am too old to have a husband. Not only can I have no children, <laughs> but nobody's going to want to marry me. I think this is a mark of godliness that Naomi refuses to paint this rosy picture of being with her. She says, if you're with me, you need to be with me only for Yahweh. There's nothing else that I can give you. She says in verse 12, if I said I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight, which is impossible. The Hebrew is indicating that this is a total hypothetical impossibility. But even if some miraculous way I could have a husband right now, would you therefore wait till they were grown? I mean, this is a, a little bit of sad, tragic comedy even. I mean, they're going to be these little babies and you guys are going to have to marry somebody from the cradle. Would you therefore refrain from marrying? And she says, no, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you for the hand of Yahweh. And this is where she brings it back to the hand of Yahweh has gone forth against me. I love Naomi for this. You know, if I was in her situation, I would say, you know, I'm reaping the consequences of the sins of my husband. But she doesn't even speak in that way. She says, it's my sin. I, maybe I should have, have said more. Maybe I should have spoken up. I take full responsibility for it. I am being disciplined by Yahweh. I am submitting to the discipline of Yahweh. And daughters, I don't want you to be part of that because I am a poor woman. I'm an old woman. I'm a childless woman. I'm a non-able-to-get-married woman. There's no reason for you to be with me. Go and have your lives here on this earth. And again, verse 14 both Ruth and Orpah lifted up their voices and, and wept. The, the Hebrew literally means loud wailing. I don't know if you've been able to be at some, maybe funerals from different cultures where they even have professional mourners. And I've, I've been to some of those in some, some villages in India. And uh, it almost makes you want to cry. You know, because they're just crying with, with volume and intensity and, and emotion. And this is genuine in this case. And it shows that both of them were just being torn apart because they love this lady. One of them in just an earthly way, but they love this lady. And so they lifted up their voices and they wept. But now here's the thing. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and the indication is in verse 15. She walks away. She walks away. Orpah's name literally means deer or hind and that's kind of funny because she takes off like a deer and she moves away from that situation and it's very clear why she loved naomi but when it comes to the crux of the matter she wants earthly security more than anything else and she seems to commit but when the going gets tough she gets going and she doesn't stay it should remind us of verses like 1 John 2, 19, right? Sometimes we get so surprised when people leave the church, as the church goes through trials, as the church goes through difficulties, but you know what? That's the hand of God. Sometimes you need church growth by subtraction. We don't like it, but it needs to happen so that the church becomes stronger. Sometimes we're so obsessed with numbers. You know, we just want people. We just want, well, oh, there's empty chairs there. Oh, Lord, what are you doing? And, and you're doing a good thing. 
because you're helping us to be more pure so that those that are here are here because of you and nothing else. 1 John 2, 19, they went out from us because they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. Those that are in Christ never go away. John chapter 10 and verse 28, no one can snatch you out of my hand. Amen? I believe in the sovereignty of God in salvation. If somebody walks away, it's not because they lost their salvation, because that salvation was never theirs to begin with. <laughs> it was because they never had faith. And that's why they left. And you can see, in contrast to Orpah, you can see Ruth. And by the way, the word Ruth means true friend or companion. It's interesting. It even comes from the Hebrew root roe, which is used in Psalm 23. You love Psalm 23? The Lord is my roe, my shepherd, my friend who comes alongside me and cares for me. And you can see Ruth being just that because she has faith in Christ, because she loves Yahweh more than Naomi. Look at verse 15. Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Naomi is very clear why, why Orpah left. Why did she leave? Because she went back to her people and she went back to her idolatry. And so she even says to Ruth, return after your sister-in-law. This is evangelism like none other, right? We usually say, hey, 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 hey stay with me. But she's like, leave Unless you really love Christ, unless you love Christ more than the things of this earth, leave. And in that sense, Ruth is very much like Jesus Christ, right? Unless you hate your father and your mother and your brothers and your sisters, you cannot be my disciple. But Ruth said, I, I love these words, verse 16. And in, in the Hebrew, it's almost like a rebuke in a respectful way. Do not do this anymore. Do not urge me to leave you. Enough, mom-in-law. <laughs> I've heard all the arguments, but I'm here still. Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. And then she makes this fourfold confession of faith where she values the treasures of heaven more than the treasures of Moab. She values Yahweh more than anything this world can give. Is that what faith is to you? Faith should be Jesus being a pearl of great price where you would sell everything that you have to buy that field so that you can get Christ. And that's what happens in the heart of Ruth. Now, by the way, I don't think we need to make much of on this date, at this occasion, at this prayer, Ruth got saved. Maybe this was a process that was going on because faith is a gift of God, right? But at this time, she begins to express that which God has been doing in our heart, maybe for a long season of time. And it's a refreshing oasis to what we've just seen in Orpah. What is this fourfold confession of faith that, that Ruth makes where she values heaven? Well, first she confesses this. Yahweh, and for us it would be Jesus Christ, is more precious than this world. Yahweh is more precious than this world. Look at what she says at first. She says, For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. And it's interesting, uh, many a times I've heard this vow and this commitment being said at weddings, and that's okay, I guess, to a certain extent. But really, if you look at the context, it's between a daughter-in-law and a mom-in-law. And ultimately, it's between a young woman and her Lord. And that's where all commitment and all true faith starts. And when she says this, this first thing, she's, she's committing him, herself to the narrow way. You know, Jesus even talked about that the way that leads to eternal life is not broad, it's not easy, but it's narrow. You can't have too much baggage, right? I, I love the fact now as we're traveling internationally and overseas, it used to be where we, we would be able to carry two suitcases that were just loaded with stuff, and now they're just allowing you like 20 kilos. My, my suitcase itself weighs about 11 kilos, so you know, they're just a little three or four pieces of clothes, and that's it. And, and they're teaching us to walk the narrow way now, even when you fly. But especially 
in terms of thinking about eternal life. It's, it's not where you can carry a lot of entanglements and distractions from this world and you need to give up much in this world. And so Ruth says, I am willing to do that. The idea of where you lodge, I will lodge. You know, our translations make it seem like a hotel or something. But the word lodge in Hebrew literally means to be able to sleep on the roadside in a place where maybe there is no shelter. And, and Ruth is even saying, Naomi, I know you're a poor woman. I know you've lost everything. I don't care. I want to be with you, and I want to follow you, and I want to follow your God, even in times of poverty. That's what she's saying. Because Jesus is sufficient. Because Yahweh is sufficient. She says, I see the Lord as more precious than this world. You know, when I, when I travel around sometimes and, and visit some villages in India, I was able to go uh, to a place in Orissa where it was a tribal district and we were able to do some meetings. They lived in, in this fantastic place. No electricity. It was just fun. You know, when the sun goes down, you know, you go to sleep and, because there's no lights. And, and these people are poor, but they're the most generous people, the most generous Christians I've ever met. I remember sitting in, in this village hut and they made this food. They, they killed a goat, which was probably, I don't know, six months' salary for some of these people. And, and, and they served us, and I noticed that none of them were eating it except for, for serving it to, to us because we were teaching there. And, and as we were looking at these, these people, we said, you know, why are you being so generous to us? And the answer always came back to this, this singular reason. It's because God in Christ has been so generous to us. The things of this earth don't matter anymore. He has made us rich. And sometimes those of us that are, that are living in the distraction of this world, we lose that perspective, don't we? That Christ is more precious than anything this world can offer. And Ruth got that. Young believers can, can cause us to rise up from our grave of decadence sometimes, right? She says, where you lodge, I will lodge. But not only does she say the Lord is more precious than all the earthly materialism of this world, she says this, the Lord's family is mine. The Lord's family is mine. Look at what she says here. She says, your people will be my people. I don't just love you, Ruth. And this, this shows it's not just some kind of a affection just for you as a person, but I want to be part of the nation of Israel. That's what she's saying. She hasn't even been there, but maybe she's heard about it from Naomi that God promised Abraham and God worked through Moses and he had created a nation out of the wilderness. And she says, I want to be part of that promised people. I want to be under the covenant of Yahweh. That's what she's saying. She loves the people of God. And at that time, it was the nation of Israel. In our day, in our context, it's, it's the church, isn't it? And isn't it wonderful to see new converts and the way in which God gives them this affection for the people of God, sometimes because they lose their earthly family and they have nothing. And they begin to see that, you know, I lost a mom and a dad because I follow Christ, but I've got six fathers now in the church. I've got three mothers. I've got all these brothers and sisters. And the family of God has just become so much more real to me than even my earthly family. And Ruth begins to sense that. And she says, Naomi, I, I'm rich, not in possessions, but I'm rich in the family of God. 1 John 3, 14. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we what? We love the brethren. You can't say, you know, like Simon and Garfunkel, I am a rock, I am an island, you know, and just live by yourself as a Christian. You, you, once, once you become saved, you begin to love and have affection for the body of Christ and love them like family, even more than your earthly family. She says, the Lord is more precious than this world. The Lord's family is mine. She says, the Lord is my only Lord. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father apart from me, right? And so Ruth even begins to realize that. Look at the rest of this verse. She says, your God will be my God. I give up the idolatry of Chemosh and all the plural idols that we worship, and I say that there is only one God under heaven, 
that I see as the true God, the living God, that I will submit to, that I will bow down to. She knows the Shema, right? Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. That there is one God and we shall love him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. She forsakes idols for the one true and living God. Isn't that the reality of our lives? And maybe sometimes our idols aren't idols of stone and wood, but they're idols of maybe just the things of this world, right? Like technology and and cell phones. Remember, I, I lost my cell phone in the ocean one time when I was in Goa, and I was in depression and mourning for three days. And I began to realize, you know, I need to learn how to live without technology. We've got so many idols in our lives. And, and Ruth began to realize that even as a new believer, she refreshes us and she says that there is just one God and He is enough for me. The Lord is my only Lord. I exclusively follow Him. And then she says this, and this is, this is the final thing. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried, verse 17. And then she makes this oath Thus may the Lord do to me, and she's using the covenant name of Yahweh, showing that she is committed to him, not just to Naomi, and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. She literally says, the Lord is worthy unto death. I know that this may not be a road of earthly blessing. I know that I might even die in poverty with you, but I am willing to die. She's making an irreversible plan because... In this sense, even, she believes in the resurrection from the dead. She says, even death is not greater than God's love, and I will rest in Him, and I will not fear death. She takes the name of Yahweh and acknowledges that reward may only be in heaven, maybe not on this earth. That's a gift that is given to her by God. We don't want to look at this passage and say, oh, Ruth, what a great hero of the faith you are. But we want to say, oh, God, what a great God you are to change this idol-worshipping woman and make her into a woman that has such courage in the midst of no earthly hope. This is only your work, oh, God, and you do this in our lives as well. You see? This is what has always motivated missionaries in the past. I was just talking earlier to somebody that was working in the New Hebrides Islands, and John Patton was one of the first missionaries that went there. And that's pretty close to Australia, isn't it? And I remember when he was going out reading his biography, his, uh, his church, I think it was the Baptist church, they were trying to discourage him and saying, you can't go there, they're cannibals, they'll eat you. The first day of your gospel ministry, you will die, eaten by cannibals. And he turned to one of his board members, his elders, and he said, sir, we're all going to be eaten. We're either going to be eaten by worms or eaten by cannibals. <laughs> and I would rather be eaten by cannibals because I know that I will be raised on the last day. Whether I'm eaten by worms or cannibals, I will be raised on the last day by my Lord Jesus Christ. And so he went. And I was talking to this brother even earlier today. I think it's about 80 or 90% of those islands now believe in the Lord Jesus Christ because one man was willing to count the cost and say, the Lord is greater than death. Ruth was able to count the cost and say the Lord is greater than death. And what happened? David was born. When men and women are willing to live by faith that is given by God in the Lord Jesus Christ, he will make you more powerful than anything that you can do in your own strength. Amen? Let me just close by reading Matthew chapter 19, verse 28 and following. It says this, And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that you have followed me, In the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on His glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. This is our hope, isn't it? In faith. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters, maybe some of you can identify with that, or father or mother or children or farms, for my name's sake, shall receive many times as much and shall inherit eternal life but many who are first will be last. And those who are last will be first. Amen? Let's pray. Father, help us to live by faith. It's a constant battle for us, Lord, to to count the cost and to recognize the value of living in you 
and living in the hope of heaven. But help us to show this world, Lord, even as your children, that heaven is so much more real than anything that this earth can offer. And in that sense, Lord, help us to become salty in this earth and demonstrate to this earth a value system that is able to really make an impact for eternity, not just in the temporary realm, but for eternity for the gospel's sake and for Jesus. Use us, Lord, until you come for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.